morning. Why don't we all stand together? Welcome to Fellowship for the Rock. You guys excited about praising Jesus? Yeah? All of you got to sleep in this morning, so we should be wide awake. <laughs> Here goes, let's do it together. Your love awakens. There are walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. And there were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name. Then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens. All right, do this with us. Come on. Let's wake up and let's do this together. Yeah. Come on, let's give God praise in this place. Roaring with power and fire. 
God, let's give God glory in this place. He is so good. Fellowship, let's lift our voice.
Good morning. It's great to be worshiping together in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to continue in this time of worship with the bringing of our tithes and offerings. So if you'd like to give anything here at Fellowship of the Rockies, you can do that online through our website. Do that in the boxes in the back of this room. If you'd like to mail something in, this is all up to you. It's just another way that we worship God. It's another way that we join with what he's doing in our community, in our time, and in this context that we live in. This last weekend, uh, this last Wednesday night, we had a worship night out here in the parking lot. It was an amazing worship night. It was an amazing time together. We lifted our hands together. We worshiped Christ together, and we were unified as one body to do that. It was an amazing few hours uh, of worship. And, and in that time, I shared a little bit about um, blessing, what God has blessed, what he's, and what some of the stories of his blessings are. Are and, and if you're familiar with Genesis 1 and 2, it's the creation story, right? And so in six days, God creates the heavens, the earth, all that's around us, beneath us, above us, all of it, he creates. And then on the seventh day, he rests. But in this story, he blesses three things. He blesses the animals, he says, to be fruitful and multiply. And then to the humans, he gives a similar blessing, be fruitful, multiply, and then rule and reign and subdue the earth. Be my partners in creation. And then the third thing he blesses is kind of an easy thing to, to pass over. But he blesses a day. It comes to the seventh day, to the day of his rest. He delights in his creation, and he blesses that day, and he calls it kadosh, holy. It, it was set apart and consecrated. He blesses it. See, what I think sometimes we get caught up in is that we have to be in a certain place or with certain people or in a certain uh, um, area in order to worship the Lord, to have access to God. But our God is not the God of, of a place or a thing. He is the God over, over time, over moments. He is accessible. We don't have to go into a certain building or be in a certain context. We can find God. He is accessible because he's the God over time. He's blessed time that we might experience him within it in holy moments like this, where we come together, we humble ourselves, we unify around Christ himself, and we worship the Lord. These are the moments that God calls blessed and holy. Let me pray, and we'll continue in this moment of worship. Father God, we love you, and we trust you, and we lift your son's name high. Jesus, we exalt you. You are worthy of our praise, so we pour it out before you. You are holy and you are worthy. Jesus, in your holy, precious, and matchless name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eli. Before we sing this, this next song, I just want to explain a few things. I think that, uh, you know, we'd all be lying if we said we're perfect all the time, that we never sin, we never do the wrong thing. That'd be a lie for me. I know that there's been times in my life uh, over the years where I did some horrible things and and God was always there for me, but at the same time, I had my doubts about who I was and would God even want me anymore? You know, those kinds of things. Am I worthy to be in his presence? Or, or probably none of us are worthy to be in his presence, but he honors your presence nonetheless because the way it works isn't that way. It's, it's by grace. You give your life to him and, and he forgives and he forgets those things. The first part of the verse says, sometimes I'm strong and sometimes I'm weak. But I'm telling you right now, someone in this place needs to hear it, whether it's from your past, whether it's right now. And God's talking to you directly and he's saying, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm waiting for you. You are my son. You are my daughter. So as we sing these words, maybe you listen first. Maybe you start to sing and, and then just start to believe. This word is for you.
Hey there, everyone. My name's Brady. Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before this weekend's message, we'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around fellowship. So check this out. Come join us for a church picnic to fellowship as an entire congregation from 1 to 5 p.m. on September the 11th at Lake Manequa Veterans Memorial Park. The church will provide hamburgers, hot dogs, and condiments. We'll also have an ice cream and snow cone truck where you can buy some sweet treats. This will be a potluck, so we're asking for your support in the following ways. 
your last name begins with an A through K, bring a drink to share. If your last name begins with an L through Q, bring a side dish to share. If your last name begins with an R through Z, bring a dessert to share. And please bring your own lawn chairs and blankets, and feel free to bring lawn games as well. Registration is open. Are you new to Fellowship of the Rockies or just want to know your next steps? We want to meet you. Join us for Discover Fellowship September 25th at 1130 and have lunch. Our hope is that you'll connect with other church members, learn our core values, find out where you can serve, meet some of our staff, and become a church member. Register on our church website. We can't wait to see you there. Child Dedication will be the weekend of October 8th and 9th. If you're interested in dedicating your child to the Lord, we're going to be having a class on September 25th during the 9 a.m. service for you and your family. The purpose of child dedication is for parents to present their child before God and the church, committing to seek after his grace and wisdom in carrying out their responsibilities. Sign up for the class online today. Did you know we have an app that helps you to sign up for events? It also lets you sign up for life groups, see our calendar, access your giving, and even check in your kids for services. Download the Church Center app on your mobile device and search for Fellowship of the Rockies. We're happy that you joined us this weekend. For more information on any events or ministry, please visit our website, fellowshipoftherockies.org, or stop in at the information desk in the foyer. Have a great week. Here's Pastor Eli with a message. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good. It's great to be with you this morning. Like Brady mentioned, my name is Eli Finley, and I'm the youth pastor here at Fellowship of the Rockies, and I'm honored to be teaching for Pastor Charlie this weekend, who is taking a vacation. He's out of town this weekend, getting some much-needed rest, but he will be back this week in office, and he'll be back to continue his sermon series in the book of Nehemiah this next week. So I invite you to come back for uh, Pastor Charlie's sermon this next week as well. I'm honored to be teaching for him. If you've been with us for any amount of time, if you have uh, seen me teach before, then you know that I've been walking through the book of 1 Peter. It's kind of our sermon series on the side as Pastor Charlie walks through Nehemiah and other uh, parts and pieces of the Bible. I've been walking through the book of 1 Peter, and so it's taken us uh, pretty much all of 2022 to, to walk through the book of 1 Peter whenever I've been teaching, and so I'd love to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 12 through 19 to begin uh, our time together this morning. And as you turn there, click there, however it is that you get to your scripture, as you head that way, uh, I'd love to uh, kind of edit one of the announcements real quick. Um, Brady mentioned, um, I realized why I couldn't remember the name of the park. It's because he was saying Manaqua, Lake Manaqua. And I didn't catch that until just then. It's like Minaqua Park, um, and it is not happening today, okay? The, the, pac the picnic is not happening September 11th today. It's happening September 18th. That is next Sunday, 12.30 p.m. We would love for you to come Come hang out. It's gonna, we're going to have yard games and all kinds of stuff going on there. We would love for you to just come. Let's all relax together. Let's enjoy a day in the sun, hopefully the sun, together. Uh, and we'll, we'll eat some food, run around a bit in the park. And so we want to invite you to be there. If you'd like to help us out, we, we need to like move some tables there, move some tables back, you know, grill some things up. If you'd like to help us to do that, uh, you can sign up to help us uh, with that online or in the Connect Center that's right outside here in the lobby. We'd love some help uh, taking care of that. But want to invite each of you, would love to see you there, bring your family. We would love to hang out and have a bit of intentional time together as a congregation, as a community. Um, it's really, I love doing events like this because it takes like our, our 5 p.m. crowd and our 9 a.m. crowd and 10.30 crowd and we all get to be in the same spot for a little while. I love getting to do things like that. So I want to invite you. Let's, let's meet some new friends from the other services that are also in the church as well. would love to invite you to that. If you haven't made it to First Peter yet, um, just keep turning to your right, okay? You will make it there eventually. We've been walking through uh, the, this, um, this letter for a few months at this point, and what Peter has been trying to do is build a theology for people who are walking through suffering. That's his goal. He wants to tie them back to the teachings of Jesus, of the Torah, of the law, the prophets, all of these things. He wants to r encourage these believers through reminder of the teachings that they've known since they were young. But th this is what happens is when we enter into suffering like this, when we enter into times of suffering and difficulty, it changes our view of the world. It changes our view of God. And in fact, God's fully aware of this, that when we as human beings, when we walk through suffering, when we walk through difficulty, it changes the way we see him. It changes the relationship that we have with God. It absolutely has the power to do that in our lives. God is aware of this, and he knows it's how 
it happens and how it works. Peter's aware of this, which is why I believe he's trying to encourage the believers through reminder. He's trying to draw them back into their first love of Christ and, and of theology, what we believe about who God is, what he's done, what he is going to do for us. When we walk through suffering, it's important to be rooted in those types of theological ideas. It's important to lay a base level and a ground level for us. And so Peter walks through many of those things. He, he, he builds uh, a couple different areas of theology about identity, who we are in Christ, who Christ was, what he has done, the work he came to do, all of those things. He builds that up and then begins to speak into the issue of their day, which was suffering. It was persecution. They were uh, proclaiming that Jesus was Lord in a place and in a time when only Caesar could be Lord. They were absolutely walking against the grain of the society they lived in. And it's into this context of people, into that movement of people that Peter says these words in verse 12 of chapter 4. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised. Do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you should suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, criminal or even as a meddler. I don't know what meddling is, is exactly, but don't do it. There's a Scooby-Doo joke in there somewhere. I haven't thought of it yet. Verse 16, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter has developed theology for these people. It was time to face the issue head on. Suffering, difficulty in our lives, and in these, people life, these people's lives, it looked like persecution. And he's like, you get to bear the name of Christ and be persecuted for that. You should be overjoyed in that, which is a difficult thing to say to a people who are walking through perhaps a dark night of the soul, a time when they feel that God is not near them. Peter has two responses to this idea and this concept of suffering in the Christian walk and the Christian life. And this is kind of a part two sermon. Uh, I gave a sermon also about suffering about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. It was a while back. Um, but, but this is the second response, and that first sermon was the first response that Peter gives to walking through suffering. The first response is to remember your hope. Remember the living hope that Christ came and died to give you. Remember the person and the work of Jesus, that you can have a fresh vision for what the future is supposed to be as a follower of Christ. And also, this living hope is a balm for the suffering that we have. It's a salve that soothes the wounds that we will incur walking through the world that we walk through. So your first idea is to remember your hope. And the second idea that Peter gives, and this is where we're going to camp out today, is simply act like Jesus. Act like Jesus did. That's his goal for us. That's how we deal with suffering, is acting like Jesus. When you suffer for doing good, act like Jesus. When you suffer for being a Christian, act like Jesus. Jesus. It, when the world is literally ending, we will read that verse in just a moment. When the world is ending, act like Jesus. That's his goal for us. That's what he wants us to set our minds on, even in our deepest suffering. Act like Jesus. Now, Jesus himself is familiar with suffering. He's, he's not a stranger to suffering. In fact, the latter half of the scroll of Isaiah refers prophetically to Jesus as the suffering servant. And that's the role that Jesus sees himself taking up whenever he comes into ministry and he begins his earthly walk to, to create disciples and bring about his kingdom. He sees himself as a suffering servant that is going to be beaten and broken for the transgressions and iniquities of the people he wants to lead and to love, which includes us in this room today. But this role, as we become disciples of Christ, is one that we also take up, which does not sound like good news, I know. But it's even here in the text, Peter says, you get to walk through the same suffering that Jesus has walked through. That means something. It means, for one, that we have a really good example 
of how to walk through that suffering. Jesus himself is the example of how we are to walk through suffering, how to deal with it, which I believe is the point that Peter's been making throughout the back half of his letter. And so that's the name of my sermon for us today, is Suffering Servants. This is the role that we take up as we follow Christ. He, the original, the, the, the greatest of the suffering servants, the high priest even of the suffering servants, and we fulfill a similar role. And so today we're going to talk about three things that suffering servants do in dealing with suffering. I feel like I said suffering like seven times in ten seconds. Whew, okay. Suffering servants, okay, and facing suffering. The first idea here, and I've already mentioned it once, is to act like Jesus. Act like Jesus. That's your first point this weekend, is to act like Jesus. Peter's response in the face of suffering is to act like the man who knows how to suffer. Jesus himself. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, this is what Peter says. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. In other words, act the way that he did. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. And as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. We choose in our lives to actively reflect the will of God. What more could be like acting like Jesus than that? Is reflecting the will of God. And so growing up for me, there was kind of some mystery to this idea when we say act like Jesus. Uh, there was generally a disconnect that I felt. And here's why. It's because of the 90s bracelets that you walked around with WWJD all over them. Okay, what would Jesus do? Are you familiar? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, what would Jesus do has been a movement for quite some time now. Okay, and when, when I was a kid and I began to hear this idea of dealing with life by wearing the bracelet and saying, what would Jesus do about every little situation that I was ever in? It felt kind of inaccessible and a little bit weird to try to understand that. And here's why. is because I would come to a situation and I would say, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus was a 30-year-old Jewish rabbi in the year 0 AD, 2,000 years ago. I have no idea how he would act in the situation that I'm in now. Jesus never had smartphones. Jesus never had a car. He had to walk everywhere he was supposed to go. Okay, Th there's at least a little bit of disconnect here. When we talk about living how Jesus lived, a little bit of that may seem far-fetched because he lived in a very different time in a very different place than we do. That doesn't mean that we can't take up his actions. We'll get there in just a moment here. But that's, that's what the disconnect was for me. It was hard to connect with the idea of acting like Jesus did because he lived such a different life than I live. Such a different life. But I don't think Peter is trying to sell us on some bracelets here when he says act the way that Jesus acted. I think he literally means act in the way that Jesus acted when he faced the realities of life. What's great about the Gospels, the four Gospels that we have, is that they don't just record Jesus' words. They don't just record his teaching. They record his story. So, so we don't just have the words that he said, but we actually have these situations and these moments when Jesus faced suffering or faced difficulties that we can actively see how he chose to respond to those things and how he actively chose to live his life in light of them. And Jesus was no stranger to suffering. I feel like the cross is an easy example of this. He went through the ultimate suffering that no other human being is, has ever gone through or ever will go through. So he took, he bore the brunt of the transgression and sin for each and every one of us on a cross. Okay, That's ultimate, deep suffering. But even beyond that, Jesus dealt with far more suffering than just the physical. He was betrayed and denied by some of his closest friends, the Apostle Peter, denied Christ three times. Judas walked with Jesus for years, knew Jesus personally, betrayed him. Further than that, Jesus didn't fit in with his peer group, okay? The other rabbis, the Pharisees, kind of involved with getting this guy killed, okay? Didn't really fit in with his peer group. And even uh, the Gospels record a story of, of Jesus' own family, not believing that he was the Messiah. They didn't believe that he was who he says he was when he first began his mission, Jesus dealt with far more suffering than just the physical. He dealt with it on an emotional level, on a social level, all of these things. But for some reason, Jesus found a healthy, uh, and beyond just a healthy way, but, but a godly way to respond in all of these situations. Yes, he is the son of God. He is God represented to us, to humanity. So of course, he'd be reacting in godly ways. Uh, but, but that's where we can actually take 
what's going on here and begin to apply it to our lives because we can respond to suffering in the way that Jesus did. It's different to come to every single little situation and say, what would Jesus do? Well, I don't really know in this like, exact situation. It has a bunch of nuance and context, all these things. But when we actually just take the patterns of Jesus' life, how he lived, how he responded to things like suffering, that's how we can begin to act like him. That's how we can begin to respond to the world around us in godly ways. Modern psychology would call it this, mental maps. All of us make mental maps maps, okay? And here's, here's kind of what mental maps are designed to do, what they are. This is just how our brain works. Uh, we work by making mental maps. They're how we travel through existence in our thought lives, okay? It's how we consciously make choices and make sense of what we're doing or where we're going. It's, it's decision navigation, okay? Now, Jesus, w- we can say that he had mental maps, and I'm sure his brain worked that way, but, but that's how we would, in the modern day, kind of talk about this idea of taking the patterns of Jesus, how he made the decisions that he made, and actively begin to copy that in our lives. It's decision navigation. And we all have mental maps. And the easiest example that we have, <clears throat> every one of us in our lives, uh, every one of us has a route that we drive to work or to school, right? Every single one of us. You wake up in the morning, Monday through Friday probably, and you drive to work. Now, you don't really, it doesn't take mental energy for you to, like, get to work, right? You get in the car, turn on the ignition, and, you know, five, twelve minutes later, you're kind of just there. Like, it didn't really take a bunch of, like, mental action and and difficulty energy in order to get you to work, right? Because you've you've driven it so many times. You know how to drive on a road. Uh, Even though every time you drive to work, it's different based on who else is on the road and all that good stuff. There's a million different, uh, uh, like, factors going on there, and yet, it doesn't really take much mental energy for you to get to point A to point B because you've done it so many times. You know how to get to work. And this is how, like, you can pull up to work or back home or something like that, turn the keys and the ignition off, kind of pause for a second and, like, wake up, and you're like, hmm, I don't really remember how I got back here, and I could have run seven red lights on the way, and I don't really know if I did that or not. Is that just me? Okay. None of you ever, like, kind of wake up, and you're like, wow, I wasn't really paying attention that's because our brains, we, we know how to do, we know how to drive cars. We know how to do that. We know how to get from point A to point B. Well, the same uh, concept works when it comes to decision making. When it comes to facing suffering in our lives, we have a mental map of how we're going to proceed. We have a mental map of how we're going to like uh, either get out of this situation of suffering or we're going to pursue comfort or something like that. We all have mental maps. That's, that's how we deal and how we make choices based on reality, based on what's happening to us. Our mental maps are how we actively respond to life. And if our goal is to deal with suffering by acting like Jesus, then that will look different than how suffering is dealt with by the world, by people who are around us who, who do not follow Christ. Peter refers to this here in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4. He says, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing. Once again, another word. I don't know what carousing is, but you shouldn't do it. Carousing and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you for it. See, the, the important phrase here is what Peter says, what the pagans choose to do. See, he's talking about taking on suffering for Christ, right? And he says to the Christians, you should actively adopt the attitude of Christ. But to the pagans, he says, they, they choose to do these other things. This is how they deal with suffering. It's by carousing, once again, not totally sure. By carousing, detestable idols, they, they lose themselves in other things. That's the way their mental map works. And one possible mental map for us dealing with suffering is to self-medicate. Every one of us in this room is familiar self-medicating. When life gets hard, we can numb ourselves with a bottle. When God disappoints us, we can go find another God to serve and to try to please or to make us happy. When a relationship or a marriage ends, we can find our way to a new something or a new someone in order to hurt those who are around us still. We can medicate that pain. We can medicate that suffering in a myriad of different ways. Some mental maps are more damaging than others. Some mental maps are easier to develop than others. And even Peter says here, the people that he's writing, he said, you've spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans do. Our natural bent as people 
is, is not to react to the world in godly ways. It's not to, uh, our, the natural bent of our mental maps is not to react to suffering in a godly way. He says it to the, to the pagans that he's writing to, or sorry, not the pagans, to the people that he's writing to. He says, you have experience. Every one of us right now deals with suffering in a specific way. I don't know if that reflects God or not. You'd have to be the judge of that in your own life. But, but each and every one of us does deal with suffering in some sort of way, whether that's healthy or not. It takes reading what Jesus did and applying it to our lives. And here's what I'm trying to get us to is that Jesus built his mental maps around God, around the word, and around spiritual practices. And I'd love to nerd out about each one of those little things here, and I'm not going to chase that rabbit hole. But here's the idea is that, that we can change the mental maps that we have. We can. It takes time. It takes dedication and commitment. But we can change the mental maps that we have. We can change the way that we make decisions. And to kind of bring back our driving metaphor for just a moment here, um, when I first moved to Pueblo, Colorado uh, on my own, uh, I was 19 years old, and my dad wrote me up a map like the night before I left, okay? And uh, it's kind of sweet because, like, he knew I wouldn't understand if he, like, drew a line, you know, and drew Texas and Colorado and all this good stuff. I was driving from uh, north of Dallas to, so like, Sanger. None of you know where Sanger is. Sanger, Texas, back here to Pueblo, Colorado. And he wrote me out a map, and, and he wrote, like, you know, you'll, uh, you need to get on Highway 82. It'll hit Highway 287 here, and you'll drive through these four towns, and then you know, one day you'll make it to Amarillo and you'll really understand what suffering is after that and then you'll go around Amarillo and you'll hit text line eventually. I don't know, you just don't miss the sign. And, you know, I, I joke, but, but he wrote me out a map and the first two or three times that I drove that drive alone, needed the map. It was like kind of reading down where I was at, figuring out where I was going to be. And it was also really sweet of my dad because, you know, it's not like I didn't have a smartphone. I couldn't just, you know, ask Siri to get me there. I'm just saying. But it was really sweet of him to write this map and I've used that map a lot. I still have it uh, at home, I think. But but the point is this, by the time I drove it for the third or the fourth or the fifth time, I kind of stopped needing the map, okay? And at this point in time, I've driven from our parking lot to my mom's house like four or five times. And if you gave me your keys and you're like, I want to see your mother's house, 10 hours, 20-something minutes, we could be there, okay? And, and I probably wouldn't have to pull up a map because I've driven it so many darn times. Oh my gosh, so many times. It's frustrating. And yeah, it's, it's where I wrote this sermon about suffering. It's right there between Amarillo and and like Wichita Falls, anyways, it's desolate. If you don't know what I'm talking about, God bless you. God bless you. We can change our mental maps through repetition, through learning how to do that. After a while, I no longer needed the map that my dad gave me. I learned how to make those decisions and how to get there on my own. And in the same way, when it comes to suffering, we can actively begin to change our thought lives in a way that we can reflect a godly response to the suffering that happens in our lives. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just uh, come to each situation like, hmm, how, what would I do here? He, he became the type of person who a godly response was always number one. Now for Jesus, he obviously has a leg up on that. He was God. So the way he reacts is a godly way, period, right? But, but that's the idea is that uh, it, there's a difference between making Christ-like decisions and becoming a Christ-like person. And I think this is why the WWJD bracelet has kind of stuck with me for some time. And I heard another pastor um, illustrate it this way and talk about it this way. And it was really helpful for me. And I want to share this thought with you is that WWJD doesn't really ask the question the right way. Yes, we want Jesus active in our decisions, but, but uh, uh, coming to each little decision and overanalyzing each time, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus do, can kind of end up where I was at, where it just kind of felt like separated and like I couldn't actually live up to that standard. But, but a better question to ask ourselves is a continuation. It's, what would Jesus do if he were you? What would Jesus do if he was a middle-aged gentleman with some teenage kids who... who you know, has a job at Evraz or something, I don't know what you guys do, who has a job at Evraz, what would Jesus do if he was that person? We ask ourselves these things. What would Jesus do if, if he was a gentleman who was a youth pastor in Pueblo, Colorado, on the south end of town? I'm still working that out. I pray that all the time. Jesus, what would you do here if you were me? And that, and that leads us into this idea that, that we can take the patterns of Jesus, we can take the practices of his life, we can take how he responded to the world, his mental maps, so to speak, and we can begin to add those, to create those in our lives. And that's how we deal with suffering, by going about it the way he did. 
the goal here in our minds is to live life the way Jesus lived his life, not just theoretically, but practically. How did he respond to suffering? How did he deal with his neighbors? How did he deal with brokenness and the downtrodden people that he was around? We can see how he did these things. We can begin to shape our thought lives in the same way. And so there are two ways here in 1 Peter chapter 4 that Peter writes about how we can deal with suffering similarly to Jesus. So the overarching idea here is that we're acting like Jesus. We'll, we'll, when we're dealing with suffering, there are two specific ways that Peter mentions here in the text that we can also see in Christ's own life. These two parallel ways of dealing with suffering. And this is the first one is to remember your calling. This is what suffer, suffering servants do is that they remember their calling. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. This is kind of a callback <clears throat> in many ways to the idea of living hope. Living hope, this living hope that we have as followers of Christ, it is the reality that we now live in. It's a reality that we have, is that we have hope. We go through suffering with hope. This is another idea of the reality that we live in. You have a calling. You have a gifting. If the Spirit of God is upon you, you have a gifting and you have a calling. He's made that absolutely clear. Now, maybe, maybe part of your suffering this morning is, like, I don't know what my calling is. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know why I'm here. Well, if I can lead you to rest in the fact or give you some peace, get, have peace of mind of the fact that it does not matter what job you have, where you work, where you live. It does not matter for the calling of God because the calling of God is as simple as this, to love him and to love those Oh, that are around you, to love your neighbors. That's what Jesus says the two greatest commandments are, is to love God and to love others. And if you do those things, you will sit in the middle of the will of God. You could be a plumber in Denver and love God and love others. You could be a realtor in Colorado Springs. You could love God and you could love others. You could be a part-time worker at Solar Rose Coffee Shop here in Pueblo. And if you love God and you love others then you are squarely in the will of God. Now, does God have a specific purpose for specific people at specific times in specific places? Absolutely. Sure, he does. Absolutely works that way. The Bible is evidence of that. But when we talk in our lives about knowing our purpose or knowing what our calling from God is, we have to take a step back and rest in the fact that if we would just be sober-minded so that we could pray, if we would just love people above all other things, if we would be graciously selfless, hospitable towards others, if we would put love at the top of everything that we did, we would be squarely in the will of God. What the scripture does not say is that in suffering we can sit on the sidelines. That's not what the scripture says. Now for a moment, I'll address this as Sometimes when we walk through suffering in our lives, it's actually because of loss. It's because we have lost something or we are in the process of losing something or even someone. And it's in those moments that, no, I'm not telling you to, like, shake it off and go serve somebody because then you'll feel better about life. That's not at all what I'm saying. We learn to deal with those things the same way that Jesus did with emotional health, right? With putting God first and letting his love be the driving factor in our lives, yes, but in dealing with suffering regardless, it is not a ticket or an opportunity to stop participating in the kingdom of God. It's not an exit ramp when we walk through suffering. It's not an exit ramp out of the Christian walk or out of uh, the kingdom of God. The theme of all of these things that Peter is going to call us to do in suffering is still to participate in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 this is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount when he's talking about anxieties. He's just talked about money. He's talked about food and clothing. He talks about all of these things. And he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When we seek first the kingdom, when we participate in what's going on, we will find comfort in Christ. The needs that we have will be provided when we participate in the kingdom of God. Because God is a loving Father. 
comes alongside us. And I would say uh, on the other end of that is, is whenever people are walking through suffering, the right way to participate is to go be by their side, church. Is to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus to give comfort to those who are suffering. That's a calling when you're not the one who's in suffering. But we all know someone who is. We all can see someone who is. We deal with suffering by participating, by remembering our calling. Jesus himself remembered his calling, even in his deepest and his greatest suffering. In John chapter 19, Jesus is on the cross, innocent man, surrounded by two non-innocent men. He's dying. He's gone through deep pain, deep suffering. What does he say? It is finished. The work that he came to do It was finished. The redemption of humanity. The forgiving of sins. It's a callback to a conversation that he has with a Pharisee in John chapter 3. And and there's two verses right before the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16 is John 3.14 and 15. It's where Jesus says that just as Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that all who look to him and believe on him will have everlasting life. That was the work he knew he had completed. In that moment, in his deepest suffering, his deepest suffering, he remembered his calling, who he was doing it for. In facing suffering for us in our lives, we must remember our calling as followers of Christ. There's one last way that parallels in our text here, and Peter's going to mention, and it parallels with Jesus in dealing with suffering, and it's in his verse 19 of chapter 4 says this, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Continue to do good. In dealing with our suffering, in dealing with suffering the way that suffering servants do, we commit ourselves to the Lord. Suffering servants commit themselves to the Lord. This is all obviously all over Jesus' life. But we commit ourselves to the Lord because there is no safer place for our emotions. When walking through suffering, it is natural and it is normal to have anger, sadness, depression, indifference, bitterness, defensiveness. All of these things are normal reactions to what's going on. And I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of our time together, but God is fully aware of the suffering in our lives and how that can affect our response to him and even what we believe about him. But if there was some, ever something that was taught to us in the Psalms and the prophets is that there is no safer place for our anger, our bitterness, or our hurts than with the Lord, being committed to the Lord. And this used to confuse me a bit because I'd read a passage like Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus says that anger is murder. He doesn't say that anger leads to murder. He doesn't say that murder is a byproduct of anger or something like that. No, he says anger is murder. And so I would carry some form, of, uh, some form of guilt about negative emotions in the Christian life. That's what it kind of communicated to me. And it would be weird and difficult to read something like Psalm 137, where the psalmist ends his psalm in a really weird way. He says, happy is or blessed is the person who would dash the children of my enemies upon the rocks. It's difficult to come to scriptures like that that are obviously said in deep anger, deep bitterness, and, and, try to, and try to understand why they're written in the same place and in the same book as something where Jesus would say that anger is murder. What requ- what's required of us is that we would read these texts over and over again in light of one another. They're a continued story and that as we read as community, we would come into a deeper understanding of the picture that the scripture is painting because these two scriptures, those two scriptures I just mentioned, actually can work together in a sense to paint a picture of the reality that we live in is that anger, bitterness, and anger that is destructive towards others. It is not safe. It's not safe in our families, it's not safe in our workplaces, it's not safe in our hearts. There's only one safe place that we can authentically be angry, and it's with the one person who would even understand us, God himself. Every one of these emotions that lead us into destructive things, these mental maps that we have that lead us to destruction, 
Those things are only safe committed to the Lord, not against the Lord, but committed to the Lord. He's the only one who would understand us in those moments, and that does not make them okay. What the psalmist says in Psalm 137 is not a good thing. It's not an okay thing to wish that upon your enemy. The psalmist is being as authentic as he can with God, giving him his darkest, darkest evil desires. And it's in these moments that we actually see that we can trust God with those things, that we can actually trust him. We commit ourselves to the Lord by being our authentic selves with him, especially in suffering, especially in suffering. We don't take these emotions, bottle them up, push them away. No, they belong committed to the Lord, just as Jesus said when he said, Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is hanging on a cross. Like I said multiple times today, the deepest suffering of humankind. He's hanging on a cross. And he is authentic with the Lord when he says, where are you? Where have you gone? That is the easiest question to ask in suffering. God, where are you? It's a sad question. It's an angry question. It's all of those things. God, where are you? What are you doing? Jesus himself, why have you forsaken me? I think that if, if you follow through 1 Peter and you read it over and over again, then you come to a place where you, you, we understand who Jesus is. We know what he's done. We understand who we are, our identity in Christ. We have this, this theology built, <clears throat> and then we come to an issue and an idea of suffering, a situation of suffering in our lives. And that th theology that we studied can begin to kind of change within us. We forget what we know. We ask ourselves, where are you, God? I think that's because sometimes theology is not studied, it's experienced. The only way to know that God will be there for you in your deepest suffering is to reach for him in your deepest suffering by asking a real question. God, where are you? I talk about uh, suffering. This is one of the main questions I get asked in youth ministry all the time. Is, if God's good, why is there suffering? If this beautiful creation he's made is supposed to be good, why is there suffering? There's no cookie cutter response to that. There's no verse that you can point to and be like, oh, well, that's why. It's going to be okay. God's response to our suffering is to enter into it alongside us. It's not to isolate, it's not to leave us alone. He sends his son, Jesus, to walk in the same shoes that we have walked in, to experience the same suffering, and in fact, more suffering than we could imagine. God's response to suffering is to enter it alongside us, and not leave us alone in it. That's why this call from Peter in chapter 4, verse 19, when he says, keep your eyes on the faithful creator and continue to do good is a difficult thing to ask of people walking through suffering, but it comes from a place of being able to trust God just like Jesus trusted God. That's where it comes from, is trust, deep trust in the Father. And I think this is kind of the picture um, that Peter has been painting. We know where our identity is, our calling is, this theology has been building. And Peter gives us the reminder of the, the faithful creator and he shifts our focus upward and he uses this idea of the faithful creator. Um, I think sometimes in suffering, the question that is easiest to ask is faithful to what? We're suffering and we're, we're, we feel clouded by what's going on in our life or our situation or the suffering we're walking through. A faithful creator to what? I'd like to share what the Apostle Paul says about this in Romans chapter 8. Paul reminds us what God is committed to. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorifies. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who could be against? come to scriptures like that in times of suffering we're reminded that God is committed to his good beautiful creation and the objects of his love he has made humanity in his image for a reason that he might love them in a different way than he loves the rest of his creation God is committed to what he loves so we come to moments of suffering and we can take a step back and find comfort And one thought is this, if God is for us, who could be against? Bow your heads with me this morning and we'll pray. I'll lead us in prayer in just a moment. Uh, But after that, we're going to respond. We're going to take a moment to respond. And so uh, in a moment, I'll ask the prayer partners to make their way forward. If you need prayer in any area of your life, we want to pray for you. We want to minister to you. Um, In this moment, I just ask you to reflect Was God speaking to you as a result of his word this morning? How is he binding up your wounds? How can you be authentic before him? How can we reach out to the father that's faithful to us? Jesus, we love and we trust you. thank you for the work that you've done on our behalf the grace you show us the mercy you show us Jesus send your spirit that we might be like you that you would transform our hearts our minds that we would see the world the way that you saw the world that you see the world now Lord empower us to seek first the kingdom God, I pray blessing over all of us here gathered this morning. We thank you that we could have this moment together. Jesus, we love you. We trust you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd love if you'd stand with me this morning. And I'd like to invite the prayer partners to make their way forward. So if you're a prayer partner, if you wouldn't mind coming down to the front area. And if you need prayer in any area of your life this morning, we want to pray for you. We want to minister to you doesn't matter what you're walking through. Maybe you want to pray for somebody else that is all fair game. We want to minister to you. This is what families do is we pray together with one another. You don't need a word of the Lord to say that you need prayer. We all need prayer. Uh, And so we'll stay in this moment as long as we need to. If you need prayer, you make your way forward. You make your way down. People will let you out of the aisle, I promise. Like I said a moment ago, we will stay uh, here in this time, in this moment of prayer as long as we need to. So you just respond in the way you feel God leading you to respond. Uh, Maybe one of your responses is to connect with us. Uh, We'd love to hear about what decisions you've made in your life. We'd love to connect with you as pastors. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. Uh, If you'd like to, you just fill that out, throw it in the boxes in the back of the room. That comes straight to us. We'd love to connect with you, call with you, meet with you all. Any of those things, we'd love to do that. So you just uh, respond in that way if you'd like to this morning. Uh, And let me go ahead and read a benediction for us. Oh, before I do that, just a reminder about the picnic next weekend. Please come out, come hang out with us. We would love to spend some time together uh, in the park next weekend, so you're invited um, next Sunday, 1230. uh, Now for our benediction this morning. Out of Hebrews 13, it says, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Men, may God's grace and peace be multiplied to you. You are dismissed.